Which shoe should I buy? It's one of the first questions we all confront when buying our first road bike. The second being, do I really have to wear spandex? The answer is yes. It's in the contract you signed when you bought your new bike. But shoes, you have options with shoes. You can wear your regular tennis shoes. You can upgrade to mountain bike shoes. If you want to clip in, you can use gravel shoes. Or if you really want to look pro, you can get yourself some performance road shoes, preferably in white. In fact, the deeper you get into your cycling journey, the more it seems like road shoes are a requirement, not a choice. But why are we so wed to these road shoes? Are they really that much better? To find out, I've assembled my favorite pair of shoes in each category. Mountain bike shoes, gravel shoes, and of course, road shoes. Who's the best shoe? Say hello to contestant 1, 510 Freerider Pro. Originally from California, the Freerider Pro is the quintessential mountain bike shoe, featuring a stiff, grippy sole designed to work with flat pedals. Contestant 2 hails from the United Kingdom. Quark's Grand Tourer 2, these gravel shoes are rugged, have a tough microfiber upper and knobby soles for the times when you need to hike with your bike. And last, but not least, the Grand Tour's older sibling, the Quack Mono 2 Road Shoe. A premium road shoe with a stiff, unidirectional carbon sole designed for maximum power transfer and sex appeal. I forgot I wrote that line. Okay, uh, that's enough of that. Also, please ignore my unshaven legs. That's like a sin when you're wearing white shoes in the cycling community, but you know, whatever. The shoes will be judged on five criteria. Price, comfort, weight, stiffness, and performance. For performance, we will consider both the experience on a long endurance ride, as well as the shoe's power transfer during a max sprint effort. Before we begin, it is important to know that the judge, aka me, bought the mountain bike shoes and the gravel shoes with their own money. The road shoes were provided by Quack. And don't tell them, but I was about to buy these exact shoes myself because I was so impressed with their gravel shoes, but then serendipitously they reached out and I did not say no. However, I'm not getting paid for this review and they aren't gonna see it before it goes live. With that out of the way, let's begin. All right, hi, change of scenery. We're at my parents' house. You may recognize this from my brother vs. brother video. I'm also not on my BMC road machine, I'm on my old bike. Giant Revolt 2, and we're gonna use it to do some sprint tests today. We're using the Tax Flux. Not the most accurate trainer, but I think it's fine. It would not be fine, as you will see, but we'll talk about that later. Sprint 1 with the mountain bike shoes, the max power was 899 watts. On Sprint 2, the max power was 908 watts. Oh, not great. That was way lower than I expected. I didn't even break a thousand. For reference, my all-time best power on an indoor trainer is 1,227 watts, which was on the Wahoo Kicker. We're gonna take the average of the two max sprints for each shoe, so for the mountain bike shoes, that average is 904 watts. That will be the number we will use to compare the three pairs of shoes. Sprint one with the gravel shoes had a max power of 973 watts, and sprint two went down a little bit, 944 watts. That gives us an average of 959 watts. I'd be lying if I didn't say I, I was a little disappointed in that. I don't know if uh, it's the trainer or if it's just me. I think it's kind of a good sign that the numbers are consistently lower than expected. That suggests the first set of sprints wasn't an anomaly. Perhaps the tax trainer just reports lower than my Wahoo trainer, or, and I hope this isn't the case, I'm just not as strong as I once was. I have done previous tests on the Wahoo Trainer, so I'll compare those data to these, but I'm gonna do that in the background. I'm not gonna make you watch me do a comparative analysis. And then we'll test the road shoes. In the meantime, let's move on to the other categories. The 510 Freerider Pros retail for $150 USD. The Quack Grand Tour 2s are $265 USD. And the Mono 2 Road Shoes are $375 USD. To keep track of the ranking, I've made this handy dandy rubric. The mountain bike shoes are the cheapest, so they get a maximum of three points in this category. The gravel shoes get two points, and things are starting off rough for the road shoes, only one point. But they do look good. Next up, comfort. This might be the most important category. If a shoe is painful or even just uncomfortable, it doesn't matter if it's cheap or light or stiff. You're not gonna wanna wear it. Spoiler alert, the 510 wins this round again but not by a landslide. All these shoes are comfortable. The only reason it beats the gravel shoe, for example, is because it's slightly easier to walk in. 
Second place, as you now know, goes to the gravel shoe. I was surprised by how comfortable they were the very first time I put them on. You know how people say you should break in a shoe before a long ride? Yeah, I didn't do that. I jumped straight into an 80 mile gravel fondo with them and they felt great all day, luckily. I had the same experience while wearing them riding up the death road in Bolivia and every time since. No hot spots, no weird pressure points, and they're pretty wide too. Off the bike, the knobby grips make them easy to walk around in, which is perfect for gravel trails and also not falling while you're walking from your bike to the counter at the coffee shop. Not a true story. The road shoes receive the lowest points in this category, but compared to my previous two pairs of road shoes, they are in a league of their own. The toe box is wider, they haven't had any issues with pressure along the outside of my foot like I have with other shoes. Like all road shoes, once you're off the bike, you feel like you're tap dancing. But the hill pad in the back does help stabilize things a little bit. Category three, weight. The 510s weigh 796 grams. The gravel shoes weigh 778 grams with the cleats attached. And the mono twos finally win a category weighing in at 600 grams, also with the cleats attached. That trend is gonna continue with this next category, stiffness. The mono twos carbon sole is the stiffest of the bunch by far. The nylon composite sole on the Grand Tour 2 is pretty stiff too. I was able to hit 1230 watts while wearing them on a ride around Lake Titicaca. I am also going to brag that that was at 3,800 meters or 12,500 feet above sea level when I did that sprint, so I'm not insecure. The 510s are the least stiff of the bunch, but much stiffer than a regular shoe and way stiffer than Crocs. But that's a whole different video. The Mono 2s win this round. The final category is performance. So I've obviously done a bunch of endurance rides with my road shoes and I've done some pretty epic rides on my gravel shoes. What I haven't done is an endurance ride on these guys, the mountain biking shoes. So today we're going out for a ride, see how, uh, how they hold up. As you can probably see, I am sweating like crazy because it's the middle of the day and we just started. <laughs> as long as I survive, at the end of the ride, I'll give you my thoughts on, uh, on these shoes for endurance rides. Okay, a couple post-ride thoughts. Two things I really like about using the mountain shite. Shi two things I like about the mountain bike shoes and two things I really don't like. Number one, no stoplight anxiety. There's no worrying about like clipping out in time and there's no stress about clipping in right as you start. I thought I had overcome that anxiety, uh, but I guess I hadn't because I felt a peace on this ride I haven't felt in a long time. Number two, they are great for descending. Maybe too great. I kind of got myself into trouble on one of the descents. <laughs> Gosh, it's too much. You can move your leg and your foot in ways you can't when you're clipped in. Seems obvious, but that's actually really helpful for shifting your weight while you're descending. However, the two bad things I don't really like it all. I don't know where to put my foot. I now have foot placement anxiety. I'm constantly thinking, did I put my foot in the right place? And then because there's the little spikes on the pedals, I put my foot down and it kind of like sticks, but then it feels like it's in a weird position. So I lift my foot and put it down and I'm constantly just slightly uncomfortable. Don't love that. And the second thing may just be in my head. I feel like I couldn't get like a good cadence going and maybe that's something that would just be learned over time being clipped in feels like a smoother pedal stroke to me obviously that this is not like a scientific test anecdotally from my own like feelings on the ride yeah it feels like i'm i'm doing more it feels like a, this is requiring more energy both the gravel shoes and the road shoes are comfortable and make it easy to put out stable power for hours on end as long as my fitness holds up now what if you want the comfort of the mountain bike shoe with the ability to be clipped in like the gravel shoe? Or maybe you just don't want to carry two pairs of shoes to the office on your commute. Let me introduce you to my puppies. Not these puppies, these puppies. The Quok Weekend Shoes. As Miley Cyrus said, you get the best. The most famous shoes in this category are Adidas Velo Sambas. But if you're a sneakerhead, you gotta check out Alex Valco and his custom sneakers. Yellow, a green, and a purple. Oh, hi. I just finished my data analysis on the sprints on the Tax Trainer versus the Wahoo Trainer I normally use. Across all the different shoes, as you can clearly see here, the Tax Trainer is reporting a range of 11 to 12% lower than the Wahoo. So, 
at least we know it's consistent. Let's check in with the grading rubric. The gravel shoes are in the lead with 11 points, the mountain bike shoes are at the bottom with 9 points, and the road shoes are right in the middle with 10 points. Let's test that max sprint. Sprint 1 on the road shoes, 974 watts. Still haven't broken 1000 watts, and if I don't do much better on this last sprint, the gravel shoes are going to take the outright lead, and I don't want to say I have a favorite child, but... Sprint 2, 1052 watts. With that sprint, the road shoes have an average of 1,013 watts. You did it. That is 5.6% more power than the gravel shoes and 12% more power than the mountain bike shoes. The day after that indoor test, I wore the road shoes on a test ride for a potential new bike and produced a five second power of 12,030 watts, which is just five watts below my personal best. Just had to make sure it was the trainer and not me. So the road shoes, are the clear winner in this category. I'm so proud of you. The other takeaway here, if you care about your sprint vanity numbers, you might wanna choose a different trainer. All right, so let's just enter the final numbers in here. Oh, would you look at that? The two Quark shoes have tied for the win, and the five tens, which did not send me any free stuff, looks like they lost. That's YouTube, baby. So on paper, my paper, and in my heart, the best shoe is the road shoe. But the truth is, there is no one best shoe. Only the shoe that's right for you. And whatever ride you're doing. But what about the original question? Do we really need to be wedded to road shoes? Can you ride with something else? No. It's in the contract you signed when you bought your road bike, so. Let me know in the comments what your favorite shoe is, whether it's a mountain bike shoe, gravel shoe, or even a road shoe. And if you like the Quarks, there are affiliate links in the description. Thanks.